This video introduces the instrumental variables technique. At the end of this video, you should be able to determine whether an independent variable is endogenous or exogenous and explain why, explain the consequences of using ordinary least squares to estimate a model with an endogenous independent variable, and how the instrumental variables model affects the results, and assess the validity of proposed instrumental variables. Instrumental variables is a technique for estimating models with an endogenous independent variable. Recall that an endogenous variable is one that is correlated with the model's error term. By contrast, an exogenous variable is an independent variable that is uncorrelated with the model's error term. Why should we care about whether an independent variable is endogenous or exogenous? Remember that a correlation between an endogenous variable and the model's error term is a Gauss-Markov violation caused by issues such as omitted variable bias, measurement error, and reverse or simultaneous causality, and it leads to biased coefficient estimates. Therefore, we should be concerned that ordinary least squares, or OLS, regression will produce biased estimates of coefficients on endogenous independent variables. One solution is to try to address the underlying problem, such as adding omitted variables into the model, or replacing an error-prone independent variable with an error-free measurement. However, it is often not feasible to find the data to fix these problems. We will see that if certain conditions hold, the instrumental variables estimator will produce an unbiased estimate of coefficients even on endogenous independent variables. To understand the intuition behind instrumental variables, let's apply it to a situation of simultaneity bias. Suppose we'd like to estimate how the demand for mid-sized sedans depends on their price. We know that simultaneity bias is a concern here because the prices and quantities that we observe are determined by both the supply and demand. Of course, we do not see the actual supply and demand curves, only the equilibrium point at the intersection of the two. Suppose we collect more data on prices and quantities by waiting for both supply and demand to shift over time. Even if we collect a large amount of data, the points won't trace out a demand curve, or a supply curve for that matter. Here is the OLS estimate for this simulated data set, which clearly is a poor estimate of the slope of either the supply or the demand. The key to instrumental variables is using some additional information to help us see only the demand relationship. Note that if only the supply curve is shifted, the equilibrium points will all lie along the same demand curve. Although it's hard to find a situation where only the supply curve shifts, we might be able to collect data on some other factor that affects supply only. For example, the price of steel is likely to shift supply because it influenced manufacturing costs, but it is unlikely to shift demand since consumers probably do not care about the price of steel except for the way it affects the price of a car. High steel prices should cause the supply to shift inward, resulting in higher prices and lower quantities. Low steel prices should cause supply to shift outward, resulting in lower prices and higher quantities. Now suppose that we had information not only on each equilibrium price and quantity, but also the price of steel at the time. For simplicity, this graph only distinguishes two steel prices, high and low. Orange plus signs denote equilibria with high steel prices, and green X's denote equilibria with low steel prices. This will give us a graphical intuition for instrumental variables before we delve into the mathematical details. In this graph, take the average price and quantity when steel prices are high, and then take the average price and quantity when steel prices are low. You will get these two points. Note that the line connecting the two points very closely matches the slope of the demand curve. This is no coincidence. We have applied the instrumental variables estimator, and using econometric terminology, we have used steel price as an instrument for car price in the demand function. Let's now formalize this idea we would like to estimate a regression model like this one. For us, y is the quantity of cars demanded, and x is the price of a car. 
The problem is that our independent variable x is endogenous, in our case due to simultaneity bias. To use this technique, we need data on an instrumental variable, also called an instrument. That instrument, typically denoted as z, must meet two conditions. First, we say that the instrument is relevant, meaning it is correlated with the endogenous independent variable x. Second, the instrument must be exogenous, meaning that it is uncorrelated with the model's error term. If the instrument meets these two conditions, then the instrumental variables, or IV, estimator is unbiased. That estimator divides the covariance of z and y by the covariance of z and x. Let's parse out this information one step at a time, starting with the conditions. We said we would use steel price as our instrument z for our car price, or endogenous independent variable. The first condition is relevance, that the instrument is related to the independent variable. We should ask the question, is steel price related to car price? We expect that steel price shifts the supply curve, which in turn affects the equilibrium price of cars, so yes. Steel price is related to car price, and the instrument is relevant. The second condition is that the instrument is exogenous, meaning it is uncorrelated with the error term. We should be asking whether the instrument steel price is unrelated to other demand determinants, that is, everything that might affect demand for cars aside from price. It's hard to think of a reason why steel price would have a direct effect on demand for cars, so this seems reasonable. For now, we'll ignore more nuanced concerns, like whether high steel prices are correlated with high energy prices, which in turn could affect demand for cars. Putting that concern aside, the fact that we've satisfied both of the conditions means that steel price is a valid instrument. This video won't go into detail on the reasons why this formula works, but let's conclude with some intuition. Start with the denominator, the covariance of z and x. Covariance tells us something about the relationship between these two variables, steel price and car price. Why would these two things be related? Because steel prices shift supply, which in turn affect equilibrium prices. Now turn to the numerator, the covariance of z and y. Why would steel price and demand for cars be related? Remember we argued that steel price should not have a direct effect on car demand, but steel prices could affect car prices, which in turn affect demand. This formula is asking us to observe what happens when steel prices increase. We should see an increase in car prices, reflected in the denominator, and a corresponding drop in demand, reflected in the numerator. The ratio of these two effects could reasonably be attributed to the direct effect of car price on car demand. We also saw this in our graph. As steel prices went from low, the green x's, to high, the orange plus signs, car prices increased and demand decreased. The ratio of those changes, the slope of the purple line connecting the low and the high steel price averages, match the demand relationship quite well.